introduce our next speaker, uh, more of who he is and what he does for Indian country. Dave Koch is a very passionate uh, resource manager. Even though that he does work for the Bureau, we won't hold that uh, too much against him. But the support that he shows to tribal resource uh, management programs has been uh, great. And you know that that's that's a character that's a character trait of who he is. So, you know, with a brief introduction of who Dave Koch is as a very generous, uh, caring resource manager that cares about uh, management of tribal lands, I want to introduce our next speaker, Dave Koch. I'm not so sure I feel like a champion. I kind of feel like Rocky Balboa uh, at the end of Rocky One. Um, after being a couple years in DC. So I'd like to uh, go ahead and thank first off the Coquill Tribe for sponsoring this and secondly for ITC for allowing me to pitch, uh, pinch hit for Feline Haven. Uh, I did ask Feline for um, some information to put into this PowerPoint, but she said she didn't trust me. So <laughs> because like, like Jim Peterson said, I'm kind of like Phil, you don't know what I'm going to say half the time, so. <laughs> and for those of you that know me, that's probably accurate. So anyhow, um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is the federal perspective. Managing beyond our borders starts at home is the title of my presentation. And, uh, you know, this could be a picture of basically uh, any interior west uh, reservation out there. You know, you've got one side of the photo um, that's that's managed, and you've got the other side of the photo right along the boundary that is unmanaged and in an unhealthy state. And this happens to be um, one of the last big timber sales I put together at Mescalero. Uh, it was a 58,000 acre timber sale, so fairly large timber sale. And as a conscientious forester, I didn't want to stop at that darn border. I mean, I wanted to keep going because the stuff, the insects, the disease, the fire, you know that stuff's just ready to slop over the border. So, but like I say, this could be basically anywhere in the interior west. So with that, go to the next slide. So we've got all this collaboration framework and this collaboration um, uh, statutes that you know we work with, and as as tribal foresters, as tribal en entities, um, there's been an increasing amount of attention and budgetary priority placed on on the management of lands using this multi-jurisdictional approach. And this has been the trend not just recently, but for the last uh, 30 years. You know we've been going down this path of collaboration. And in DC, you know, we see this on a daily basis as we um, write budget justifications to send forward to the department and to OMB and finally to the president. And, you know, we see, uh, you look at the, for example, you look at the Office of Wildland Fires uh, Green Book or their budget justification, and you compare the language in that to what the Forest Service has in their budget justification. And a lot of the language is identical. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna manage, we're gonna use this cohesive strategy thing. We're gonna manage, um, we're gonna manage together, we're gonna partner together. And so a lot of this finds its way into the appropriation language. The trick though is how that actually gets implemented out there on the ground. Um, despite all the attention to, uh, to collaboration, our successes in true large scale collaborative forestry work have been few and far between. Uh, for a long time, the discussion of collaboration usually stops when we start talking about whether or not uh, we can harvest large trees on the other side of the fence. And that's where the collaboration tends to break down typically. But hopefully that's going to be changing because uh, um, uh, Butch Blazer alluded to legislation that's currently uh, circulating through the House, uh, the resilient for Federal Forestry Act of 2015. It's a bill in the 114th Congress. And hopefully that's going to provide us a little bit more collaborative framework from a statutory side that we can work with. OK, 
Okay, so back to my title. You know, let's get this right at home before we start all this collaboration stuff. As professional foresters, we've all um, have the luxury to work with a relatively small customer base, that being the tribes. And uh, we have the ability to use basically every tool in the tool book as silviculturists, as land managers. You know, we can, we can take any tool we want and implement it on the ground commensurate with those travel goals and objectives. So we have a luxury there to do that. Um, tribes have the unique advantage over other federally funded land management programs to essentially uh, ignore, you know, those special interest groups that would otherwise um, serve to um, stop wise use management of the land. Uh, as foresters, we have the ability to actually apply principles and theories contained in John Gordon's textbooks. Uh, we, can, we can use all those tools. Um, and we're not limited to the treatment of only small diameter vegetation. And, you know, we can't continue this, this low thinning forever. You know, ever since the National Fire Plan came out, we got a lot of money for fuels management. And we're low thinning, low thinning, low thinning all day long. That's not sustainable. I mean, you eventually you got to start plugging holes in these stands, do re regeneration cuts, and cut some large trees. So our foresters are pragmatic. Um, although forestry is a science, it's, it's not rocket science. For those of you that have been in this job long enough, it is not rocket science. And in most cases, tribes do a really good job holding complexity creep at bay. Um, and that starts with maintaining a clear vision of how they want to manage the forest and how we train our junior foresters as they enter our ranks. So it's, it's vital that we're always vigilant on the home front to watch out for excessive uh, complexity creep into our programs. Um, we have an allowable cut. Uh, I think Gary might have alluded to our allowable harvest level. It currently stands at 750 million board feet, which interestingly enough, uh, Butch said that the, the Forest Service's cut is 2.9 billion. So essentially we're one fourth of the uh, Forest Service cut, which is pretty amazing because we get one fourth of that cut on 8 million acres as opposed to the Forest Service on 169 million acres. So it's quite a difference in the, you know, how we view our forest in terms of a productive, uh, sustainable forest. So um, tribes are truly blessed with the talent, tools, and traditional ecology ecological knowledge to manage the land better than anyone else. Uh, this is why it's really important that Bureau and tribal foresters are um, actually the ones that are leading these TFPA projects and, and uh, leading the effort to um, plan these multi-jurisdictional projects. We do it better than anyone else. We've got the expertise. We're actually doing it on a daily basis. So it makes complete sense that we are the ones leading the charge in terms of TFPA projects. So what's all this partnering brought us? Um, we have experienced successful partnerships through authorities such as TFPA and through collaborative projects involving fuels treatments across jurisdictions. We've also experienced the frustration of dealing with the analysis paralysis of the planning process with other federal agencies and the inability of partners to make long-term supply commitments sufficient to entice industry to make investments in converting facilities. This is the ongoing conversation we're having at the local level as we attempt to implement anchor forest concept. We have had long-standing partnerships with the USDA uh, in addressing insect and disease problems, and we certainly appreciate that relationship we've had with them over the years, as well as our relationship with NRCS and um, watershed management projects that, that typically focus on density management operations. We received uh, $10 million this year to focus on collaborative multi-jurisdictional treatments on reserve tree rights lands. And that initiative in itself is interesting because it basically told us, you know, you're not going to be given this $10 million unless you collaborate. 
And so that's, uh, that's fairly unique. And I think we're, gonna, we're seeing more and more strings attached to federal funding streams uh, whereby, you know, it's not just your money, it's everybody's money. So you guys better play together uh, and do good stuff. Uh, the Resilient uh, Landscapes Program. So that's another uh, $10 million program, I believe. Uh, the emphasis this year has been placed on sage grouse habitat restoration. So the awarding of a lot of that money went to those type of partnerships and those type of collaborative projects. But um, the, la the, the authorizing language for that resilient landscapes funding basically um, applies to any type of landscape restoration. So uh, maybe next year, maybe the year after, we'll start in, uh, realizing more benefits from that um, program. We're seeing some amazing collaboration with both uh, the US Forest Service and the BLM using the uh, IFLA accounts and the IFLA authority that was uh, a part of NAFIRMA. And a lot of that's going on in the Pacific region. I don't know if Gerald Jones is here. I know John Bes Besquet's here. A lot of good work happening in the Pacific region using that authority. And, uh, at, and tribes, um, as they always have, are taking full advantage of partnerships with academia to support research on tribal lands. And I was just talking to my friends down at Mescalero, and apparently they've got a, uh, they're working with um, the university there on the CFRP Collaborative Forest Restoration Program and got a bunch of money from the state um, through, uh, by working through the university, uh, local university that actually wrote some uh, language in a bill that will enable them to get a bunch of money to treat some land. So some good things are happening all over. So you might ask, what's the BIA doing? What are we doing with respect to all this stuff? Well, the BIA is in a big rebuilding phase right now. Um, Office of Trust Services, uh, which has an FTE count of about 327 posi positions, only 150 of those are actually filled. Over the years, we've had all this downsizing, we've had um, buyouts, we've had all this other stuff going on. So. We now have um, the ability to, we've, we've given the ability to hire positions back to regional directors, and I'm talking from the, the BIA standpoint here, but um, it's gonna, we're starting to beef up our organization is what I'm trying to say. We're hiring folks, and we're, we're, we're getting to where we were when we were doing things well. Uh, the Bureau is dedicated to providing a consistent message to Department, OMB, and Congress utilizing the independent work accomplished through the IFMAT report. So the BIA is on the same team as everybody else here, and we're using the great work that ITC has accomplished to crusade uh, that message wherever we can. In that first photo I showed you, um, Aaron knows this, we've used that same photo over and over again to educate Assistant Secretary Washburn, uh, OMB, um, members of the House and testimony. And, uh, you know, we've been using these products that you guys are producing for us everywhere to communicate what we need in Indian forestry to be successful. We're also trying to create efficiencies within central office operations. And by central office, I mean Washington, D.C., where I work. Um, we're trying to create more efficiencies in our organization at BOFAR, uh, they've, they've restructured is the, would the BOFAR people stand up real quick? So BOFAR, there's Stacy, and I don't know where Mike's at, there's Mike in the back. <laughs> BOFAR's all about data, right? And BOFAR does it better than any organization, land management organization in the country. They know how to acquire data, they know how to store data, they know how to manipulate data, they know how to do all these analyses with data. So. Um, we're really relying on them to, uh, to improve our, our, uh, our data storage and retrieval capability. And they're doing a lot of good work with uh, respect to some new systems that they're developing there. I'd um, also like to recognize uh, the fire folks. Can you guys stand up too? Yeah, you can. Branch of fire management. So we got two branches in forestry. We got Bofarp and we got fire. These guys are doing amazing things with the TRM funding. They're standing up a national finance center, basically at NIFC, 
to help out with all this contracting work and the tribes that are contracted, the invoicing problem we've had over the years, getting uh, timely invoicing completed and tribes reimbursed and that kind of thing. So uh, we continue to support uh, the future workforce is critical. We're, we're sponsoring uh, 45 students now through the BIA Trees Pathways program. So we've actually reorganized and created 45 new FTE for um, students. So that's a good thing. How am I doing on time? Okay. So what does success look like? Um, so number one, uh, interagency partnership to leverage planning and environmental analysis efforts. In the last ITC meeting I was at, we were talking about some really interesting ways to, um, uh, to work with the other agencies and to apply our NEPA standards to other federal agencies and things like that, you know? And so those kind of things are very interesting to look at. Um, success looks like creating regional forest products industrial capacity throughout the country through interagency supply agreements. It's always been, you know, you get everybody to the table and you get everybody to the table and at the end of the day, well, how much can you guys supply on an annual basis? Well, we can't commit to that figure. So one of these days, it will be great if they could commit to a figure. Getting the cutout, getting our own cutout. So right now we're only at 52% of our AAC. And this is not an AAC that the BIA says that the tribes have. This is the AAC that the tribes said they have in their uh, forest management plans. So um, let's try to get that cut out. If we're not getting the cut out, we're not treating the acres, we're not getting the land managed, we're not dealing with the insect and disease problems. And let's try to keep our per acre costs low. You know, this complexity creep thing, um, everybody wants to be a rocket science, and the more rocket scientists we have, the, the more costly it is to actually get these acres treated. And the treatment of these acres, it's not rocket science, right? It's chainsaws, it's people out there with, uh, with marking guns, with nail spot, um, doing the job on the ground. So give me a big yeah for all those ground ponders out there. Yeah, <laughs> all right. How do we ensure success? So this is critical, and this has been mentioned several times already today. You know, we need to tell that compelling story of Indian forestry. We are doing a darn good job, and we've been doing a darn good job for a long time. Um, so let's keep telling that story. Um, accurate, you know, this is a DC thing. Accurate and timely performance reporting. We got to have it. It's like pulling teeth, you know, and the regional foresters that are here in the room, they know what I'm talking about. Give us the data. You got to provide what, you know, we're giving you this money for TSI. What are you doing with it? How many acres are you getting done? Are you planting ground? What are you doing? And all this is important because it all gets reported up to Congress. It gets reported to my bosses. It gets reported to everybody. And it justifies our budgets. I mean, if I can prove to folks that, you know, for every additional million dollars we get budget authority for, I can produce X for you, that's a good thing. And the only, w the only way I know what that X is going to be is if that, that data is provided up to us. Okay. And maintaining a strong intertribal timber council is critical. I mean, you guys have done more for Indian forestry. I've seen, you know, I've been in D.C. now for three years. The tribal leadership, sh leadership keep rolling in the door. If we did not have a strong intertribal timber council, we would not have any tribal leadership that really cared that much about forestry. So what ITC does, it's, it's amazingly important to Indian forestry. Um, and then, yeah, and then keeping the tribal leadership engaged, and that's one of the roles of ITC is, hey, you know, forestry is important, forestry is important, keep doing it. Okay, I think one more. Okay, closing thought. So, in, in summary, you know, I've, since I've been in my position, I've been able to look at a lot of programs, uh, Indian forestry programs throughout the country. And I want to continue to urge everyone, you know, yeah, we want to collaborate, we want to partner, we want to do all this great stuff with our neighbors but let's make sure we're doing it right at home first. 
you know, let's sure make sure we got our ducks in a row at home. Uh, let's let's make sure we're not allowing excessive complexity into our uh, planning process and our analysis process. Um, so concentrate on getting it right at home. And then uh, you know we're primed for partnering and multi-jurisdictional project collaboration because we've been doing it nonstop for years, and we're darn good at it. We know how to leverage resources because we have to. I mean, if these programs out here, all of you guys were were uh, reliant only on federal dollars to get the job done, you'd never be successful because we've been flatlined for 20 years in our TPA budget. Um, we've got really good uh, pragmatic managers that know how to do the job. We have a forest management legacy in that we've been doing this for centuries, right? Tribes have. And we have a workforce that's totally tied to the land. So. With that, I think that's all. I'd like to thank everyone for allowing me this opportunity and I'll turn it over to Jim.